Well, this is one more gas boiler coming out of a British home, but we need to get rid of thousands of these to meet our climate targets. Thank you. Welcome to The Climate Show, where we're in a kitchen in Woking at the very moment where a gas boiler is being removed and replaced by an air source heat pump. But what are the pros and cons of this more climate friendly form of heating? Also on the show, as the world's elite gather in Switzerland, is climate on the agenda? And Jodie Comer stars as a mother fighting for survival as environmental disaster strikes. And she tells us she's worried about the real climate crisis. It can be very scary and I think as a result of that we can feel stifled. But first, at the end of a chilly week in which Britain's boilers have been working overtime to keep us toasty, what does a future look like without gas heating? And are the alternatives up to scratch? We'll never force anyone to rip out their existing boiler and replace it with a heat pump. I can promise you it works perfectly. They can't afford the £13,000 for a heat pump. How we heat our homes was never so controversial. But with heating making up a third of the UK's emissions, we will have to ditch our favourite fuel. So what's the alternative? The government is backing heat pumps for most homes, but will they keep us warm in a winter chill? And are they even affordable? This detached home on a cul-de-sac in Woking is having a makeover. Wow, so you've got a lot of work going on here, shall we? Yes. <laughs> when do you hope to have it all done? Um, another, hopefully, two weeks. Two weeks. Sharma just bought this house, knowing the gas boiler was past it. It's being replaced with a heat pump. For me, it was the cutting the energy bills. Secondly, and I think equally importantly, it was the system and sustainability aspect. Mm -hmm. Despite softening the policy on banning new gas boilers, the government now provides up to £7,500 to households making the switch to a heat pump. This unit, water tank, radiators and extra insulation have cost around £14,000, reduced to 6500 after the government grant. Still too pricey for many, but Sharma believes she'll make that back over time on her bills. I must admit, I've been sceptical, so I understand. I've been there, so I'll be able to share the story and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, hopefully get others um, convinced as well. Sales of heat pumps are increasing, but we're still way behind our European neighbours and have a mountain to climb to reach the 600,000 a year the government has targeted by 2028. Many still need convincing, whether in headlines or on the high street. What, if anything, do you know about heat pumps as a way of heating your home? Oh, not a lot, I'm afraid. Uh, an engineer recommended that my house would not be suitable for a heat pump. I think they're ex terribly expensive to run, and therefore when we just done our refurb, we decided against it. And gas and boiler companies think consumers should have more choice about how to heat their homes. The Energy and Utilities Alliance lobbies on their behalf. We've seen a lot of opposition in parts of the media towards heat pumps. Do you think that's justified? It probably reflects uh, where, where consumers are because of that, uh, that fear that they're going to be forced to, to put a heat pump in. And where did they find that £13,000 from? Does the oil and gas industry have a role in shaping public opinion over heat pumps? I mean, in effect, have you been scaremongering over them? Uh, far from it. Our members make heat pumps, they make boilers, they make parts for heat networks, heat interface units. So we are you know, technology agnostic, but we want to do what is right for the consumer, because fundamentally that's got to be the way forward to get to net zero. If we alienate the consumer on the journey to net zero, my fear and the fear of people in, in organisations like mine is that we'll fail to get to net zero and that would be the biggest crime of all. Back at Sharma's house, the Swedish company installing her heat pump is betting big on demand growing in Britain. Do you think misinformation is being spread about heat pumps? Absolutely. And I think most of it is simply built on ignorance. So you have to learn how the technology works. If you know how it works, I can promise you it works perfectly. In reality, 
very few homes really need anything done to be able to fit the heat pump. That being said, the more energy efficient a home is, the more efficient the heat pump will be, but also the more efficient the gas boiler will be. <laughs> but away from all the noise, there are happy customers out there. Against the advice of his golf club friends, Peter ditched his gas boiler last year. So how have you found heating with a heat pump? Well, we, we've really enjoyed it. My wife finds the house warmer than it's ever been. You know, we get up in the morning, um, I don't need to put a dressing gown on, it's just an even temperature all around the house. And how much is that costing you? Is it more than it was before? N no, no, it's in terms of equating it to the, the comparison with, with the gas, uh, it's about two thirds of the price. So heat pumps are coming and they are expensive up front, but those using them report very high levels of satisfaction. The challenge for the government is what to do with those who can't afford to make the change without leaving them out in the cold. Well, for more on this, I caught up with the Energy Minister, Lord Callanan. The government is still backing heat pumps, but yep. <clears throat> despite your subsidies, it's still pretty much unaffordable for many people. How are you going to bridge this gap? Well, a number of ways. Firstly, we've increased the uh, grant of the uh, boiler upgrade scheme to £7,500 and we're seeing a doubling of, of applications uh, month on month uh, since we've done that. Um, so the cost is, is coming down. Several um, boiler manufacturers are announcing um, support schemes. So Worcester Bosch, for instance, last week announced a 2500 cash back in addition to the boiler upgrade scheme. So fairly soon as prices come down, as the... Uh, installation uh, routine becomes more efficient, the prices will be very low, probably cheaper than gas boilers. Uh, that's what I was wondering, if in a sense you're relying on some of the early adopters to get some volume into the market, to yeah. push the price of both the boilers and the technique of installation down. Yes, I mean, you know, relatively low levels of, of installation traditionally in the UK because we've had uh, uh, lots of uh, cheap gas available from, from the North Sea, so we relied on gas, but of course those those uh, supplies are now declining. We're having to import more uh, and more, uh, which is not good for our energy security. So all of this points us towards we need to roll out more uh, forms of electrified heating and heat pumps are by far the, by far the most uh, efficient. Volumes are taking off in, in the UK and as people become more used to them, as uh, more installations happen, the cost will start to come down. Uh, already we're, we're seeing offers cheaper than the installation of gas boilers. We're seeing some pretty hairy headlines out there about the, the failures of, of heat pumps and quite a lot uh, online as well. Do you think misinformation is being spread on heat pumps? I think misinformation is very definitely being, uh, being spread and some people are funding campaigns of misinformation. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of that uh, around. Uh, but you know, satisfaction rates of people that have installed them are sky high. I mean, the survey was done last year, 92% of people are happy with their uh, installation. And a lot of the information that's out there is just nonsensical, you know, that they don't work in the UK climate. The biggest um, uh, number of heat pumps installed in, in Europe is in Norway. And uh, obviously we know the temperatures in Norway compared to the, the UK. Why do you think these myths, as you'd call them, have such uh, traction, not least on your own back benches in the Conservative Party? Uh, there, are, there are one or two people that are, are taken in by the misinformation that's being spread, primarily by people with vested interests, I have to say, in, the, maintaining, the oil and gas business. In, in maintaining current, I'm not going to mention names, but uh, people have a vested interest in, in maintaining our current uh, uh, supplies of, of gas boilers and the like. One of the people we spoke to said, oh, it's OK, I'm going to wait for hydrogen to be rolled out. It's pretty unlikely to happen for her, isn't it? It is, yeah. I mean, uh, there is no way that we could replace our current uh, gas heating system with hydrogen. It would be expensive. It would be uh, inefficient. Uh, we just took the decision recently to, uh, to not proceed with, with the heat, hydrogen heating trial that we had lined up because of cost and unavailability of, of hydrogen. So it's clear that the majority of our decarbonisation will be electrification. It's cheaper, it's more efficient, it, it's better for our security of supplies. And that will be the primary means that we will proceed by of heating our homes in the future. One of the questions I have, it's a bit of a long term question actually, if the heat pump rollout is successful and you might get to, you know, only two or three homes in ten on the street still relying on gas, what do you do with the network then? What do you do for those people who might, maybe by definition, 
will be some of the poorest on the street. We're going to have to look at uh, how this will roll out. I mean, it's important to say this is this is not going to happen overnight. This is going to roll out over years, decades to, to come. And, uh, you know, we've, we've managed transitions in our in our fuel mix uh, before. I'm sure we can manage it again, but we need to, to look at how the cost of that can be can be fairly socialised across the across the population. That, that sounds a little bit like sweeping it uh, down the carpet or into the long grass. I mean, is work beginning on this? Because it is. Yeah. this is a multi-billion uh, problem, not uh, only for course. the infrastructure, but for uh, the household. Yeah, of course. I mean, there could be re- some uh, repurposing of, of high pressure gas mains, uh, for instance, for the use of, uh, of hydrogen, which will be used for industrial processes, for long term energy storage. But this is a long term problem. It will be over many years and decades to come. You know, we're still going to be using gas predominantly uh, for the next 10, 15 years or so yet. Now, the World Economic Forum has been taking place in Davos this week. It's really a meeting of the world's elite where they've been talking about conflict, AI and climate change. And Sky's economics editor, Ed Conway, has been there too. Well, this is Davos. It is where the rich, the famous, the celebrities, the politicians have been meeting over the course of the past week to try and talk about the state of the world. The slogan here is committed to improving the state of the world, whether they do that or not. Well, that's another question. But clearly one of the big issues here, I mean, alongside things like Ukraine, the Red Sea, the state of the global economy, is climate change. It always, it always has been. You know, they've been talking about it here. There are lots of people criticising uh, some of the big businesses here, particularly big oil, particularly some of those big fossil fuel producers of greenwashing, you know, trying to just say the right words, but not necessarily delivering on it. Um, but traditionally, this has been a big place where a lot of people have talked about uh, climate change, about getting to net zero, about the uh, industrial opportunities as well as the, the climate challenge. Um, this time around, you know, still quite a lot of talk on the fringes about it. Um, still lots of familiar faces uh, coming here to talk about climate. Actually, in the course of, of some of our reporting, uh, we bumped into John Kerry uh, from the US, and here's what he had to say to us about that challenge. What's on my agenda is making sure that the business world is fully seized with the opportunities that were created in Dubai at the COP and that we are moving much more rapidly to implement uh, the transition away from fossil fuel. Right, I see. That has to be real. So that was the message from, from John Kerry. Um, what's interesting about this kind of a place is that it's not just politicians here. You also have you know, very wealthy people, so investors. Uh, you also have politicians. Uh, you have policymakers. You have campaigners. But then you've got business as well. And actually, one of the big businesses, the energy companies uh, that are here, uh, is Vattenfall, a Swedish company. They've got a lot of hydro, but they've also got a lot of fossil fuels uh, as well, generation across Europe, including in the UK. Um, and here's what Anna Borg, who is the, the chief executive of Vattenfall, told us, kind of interesting uh, about that challenge and about what business and policymakers need to be doing. I think we can move even faster, uh, and, and I think we need to. Uh, the technologies are there, uh, the know-how is there, and I would say that the capital to fuel these investments are also there. Uh, what is needed is that uh, also government and policymakers are paving the path, of course through re regulation and, and policies, but even more so by de-risking some of these emerging technologies that really needs to be scaled up so that that can happen faster, because then private capital will move in. But I think the issue, like overshadowing this particular meeting at Davos, is that for a lot of people, particularly campaigners, there actually just hasn't been quite as much talk this time around, uh, certainly not much action either, about climate as there was in previous meetings. Um, that some of the momentum about climate change and about trying to get to net zero has been lost, that some of the businesses in particular are now just a bit nervous about saying anything on climate because they're worried about being accused of greenwashing. And the upshot is, whereas previous events were kind of defined by the climate debate, you know, particularly, you know, you had iconic figures like Greta Thunberg here. Um, I don't think she was here this time around. This one wasn't really defined by that in the same way. And it was other issues which mostly hogged the headlines throughout. So I think for a lot of people, that there's a little bit of disappointment uh, that this wasn't a kind of big moment uh, following on from the latest COP where business came together with uh, policymakers and said, look, this is what we're going to do to sort out the climate. So a little bit of a disappointing show here in Davos. Now London is depicted as a flooded and lawless city in a new movie where a mother and baby must fight for survival in the wake of an environmental disaster. 
Jody Comer takes the lead in The End We Start From, which has just been released in cinemas. Let's take a look. What you miss doesn't exist. What's going on? I'm just, just like having a moment, you know. Well, joining me now to talk about the film is our arts and entertainments reporter, Bethany Minnell. Well, first of all, what's the film like? It's utterly compelling. Um, this is a, really a movie of two halves. It's, it's about two themes, motherhood, that's the, the running theme, but motherhood in an apocalyptic dystopian world and one where the climate crisis literally is hitting at the very moment. Our, our lead character, unnamed woman, is giving birth to her first child and it very cleverly intertwines these two storylines, which seem absolutely like they wouldn't go together, mm. but it, it knits a, a really compelling story that literally has you on the edge of your seat throughout. I gather you've spoken both to uh, Jodie Comer and to the director, Mahalia Bello. Did they seem uh, engaged in the climate aspect of this? Well, it's the, it's the dramatic element of the film, so they were both engaged with it. It's fair to say that Jodie Comer is a star and she brings professionalism to everything she does. Um, she, she, she hit upon the fact it was a big theme for her character, whereas the director, Mahalia, um, really hoped it would inspire a bit of a, a change. Uh, and in fact, when I spoke to them, this is what they told me. I mean, I think we all feel incredibly overwhelmed by it, is my worry, you know, I think it's... It's, it can be very scary and I think as a result of that we can feel stifled and, and not know what it is that we can do. The feeling is that it's inevitable to some extent that unless some change happens and unless people who have some ability to make change actually really listen um, to what experts are saying because I think everybody knows we're on an island, sea levels will rise at some point, you know, what's going to happen. So it's interesting, in those clips you can see that they care about it, but at the same time they're being quite sort of careful about what they say. It's not, in effect, their natural territory. Well, they're not climate scientists. Do you feel the issue is, is kind of well handled and is still delivered with power? Because that's what everybody is hoping for, those who are concerned about these issues. Absolutely. I mean, the word apocalypse isn't taken lightly, is it? But I think we, we're really brought home that we see this kind of disaster unfurling. We see everyday people, people like you and me, having to deal with, you know, having to you know, get out of their homes, having to, to run away with their family, losing members of their family, staying in camps and sleeping on the floor. And it's a real reminder, actually, that, that disaster isn't always something that happens to other people it can happen to us and this film does that very effectively and there's also some wonderful scenes that shot in a, in a dystopian London flooded with water you know double-decker buses floating along Fleet Street which pleasingly did used to be a river so there's some very clever touches in this all taken um, from the book. One thing I wonder though is that there's a sort of fantasy reality thing here sometimes when we go to the cinema we prefer to keep it all as fantasy and our threat as fantasy you know let's say a meteor from somewhere else whereas this is a is a reality and i want i'm wondering how that'll affect the audience <laughs> it's interesting isn't it because yeah um i think we'd think twice before watching a zombie movie or a monster movie late at night on our own but potentially we should worry more about this kind of film because it's a very real threat and or this doesn't push the point too much this isn't an educational film mm but it certainly reminds you of, of our potential realities if we don't take action. And it has to be said that it's very unusual to see a, a, a woman, a mother and a baby as our lead characters. When we see those kind of characters in, in disaster and survival films, they're often the victims. So it's really nice to see them elevated to our, our, our heroine of the piece. Bethany, thank you very much indeed. So what else has been happening in climate and energy this week? Who better to answer that question than Sky's climate reporter Victoria Seabrook? And you've spotted a couple of things. Yeah, it's been quite busy this week actually. There's been quite a lot going on in the world of energy, particularly in terms of nuclear and also bioenergy, which is this controversial um, renewable power source that we have. Well, let's start with nuclear. Yeah, spotted that um, the UK has nine nuclear reactors and six of them were offline. So that means that we were without nearly 60% of our nuclear capacity wow. was offline. Yeah, and there's two reasons for this. So one is um, a few times a year, some reactors get shut down for maintenance and refueling. So two of them, they were planned closures 
fairly standard. The other four were offline because in one of the reactors they'd spotted um, a small fault. So not, not, no sort of risk, no danger. It was in a valve, in the, uh, a steam valve basically, so not actually to do with the nuclear technology. They spotted it in one reactor, so they shut down another three that have um, a similar design. So that meant, yes, that we're missing some of our, our nuclear capacity. And this comes, I think it was this week or last week, when they announced they would be extending the life of some of them as well as building new ones. Yes, exactly. So it's just a week after the government unveiled its new roadmap, which is basically a big plan to ramp up nuclear power. So when this happened, I spoke to the Nuclear Industry Association and they said, well, this just makes the case for why we need more nuclear. We've got an ageing fleet. Sometimes these little problems crop up. A lot of the reactors are going to retire soon. We need more. Sticking to energy generation, you mentioned Drax. This is the big power station that uses a lot of wood chip, most of which is coming from the other side of the Atlantic. Yeah, that's right. So Drax used to provide a lot of coal power. They then switched and started burning uh, wood pellets to create electricity. And the idea was that that was a lot better for the environment, although that is the science of that is very hotly contested. Bioenergy is classed as renewable. And so like lots of other forms of renewable power in the UK, they get subsidies uh, to the tune of six or seven hundred million pounds a year. Very contentious in the case of Drax, isn't it? incredibly because the science of it is of how good this it really is for the environment is so disputed so the idea is that you burn the, these wood pellets but the new trees that grow in the place absorb the emissions released from burning but um, a lot of scientists say uh, that it's very hard to prove that that, that will ever happen so yeah so biomass um, bioenergy is subsidized in the uk up to 2027 at the moment and there's been this big question mark looming over what happens after that the ccc the government's climate advisors they said um, that these subsidies no longer offer value for money but today the government launched a consultation looking to extend them for another few years and that's partly because we get about seven percent of electricity from bioenergy but it's also because there's there's plans on the horizon to make it more green and that's by adding on technology uh, to the existing plants to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere but because we're not quite there yet they're looking at bri bridging with some extra money for another few years well, thank you very much indeed, Victoria. That is it for this week. Remember, you can catch up on all your climate and environment news on the Sky News website and app, or by scanning the QR code on your screen right now. There will be a different presenter on the Climate Show next week, but don't worry, he's still called Tom.